I want everyone to close your eyes. Suck your lips in real tight. And cover your ears. You got to do them all. I'll talk louder now your ears are covered. Close your eyes, suck the lips in, and cover your ears. Okay, you're all perfectly situated to be good Christians. Stop. I said it again. Say it again. Someone else can hear you. I said you're all now perfectly situated to be good Christians. Now, we laugh, but this, this is the essence of religious censorship. It's don't look at anything, don't listen to anything, don't say anything, keep your hands in your pockets, and you'll be okay. You'll never sin, you'll always be pleasing to God. Now, the legal definition of, of censorship, if you look it up, is, is going to be uh, withholding public information, the burning of books, that, those kinds of things. The definition I'm going to be working on for censorship as it relates to religious bondage is this. It's the controlling of the external influences on another in order to control their behavior. So we're going to control what others read, what they hear, what they watch on TV, what they listen to on the radio, who, they, who their friends are, anything external coming in, we're going to control those things in order to prevent them from sinning, from screwing up, from missing the mark. Parents prevent their, you see this all the time in the church. I grew up in a, uh, it was a Grace Brethren church, which is essentially an American Baptist denomination. And basically all the parents there prohibited their kids from watching any movies with a rating higher than G. In fact, I remember one time, uh, one of the elders' wives, she said, I think it was movie Air Bud. If anyone's seen it. <laughs> yeah, Air Bud. And she said, darn, can't let my kids watch it. It's such a good movie, but they rated, they had to go and make it PG. She said, darn. <laughs> uh, dancing is not allowed. Now, if you've grown up like Clyde in an independent, what was it? Independent Baptist? Yeah. No yeah. dancing. No dancing. Because uh, it's going to lead to debaucherous activity. <laughs> to wild promiscuity. That's the idea. I thought you didn't have sex because it might lead to dancing. Yeah. <laughs> but books like The Lie of Every Man's or like Every Man's Battle and, and, and Martin's book, The Lie of Every Man's Battle, we all feel is, is gonna be um, probably one of your most groundbreaking works yet, I think. Um, so read it when it comes out. But you know, this 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 book creates such bondage on men. You can't so much as look at another beautiful woman. And if you do, uh, with with lust in your heart. If you, if you find her beautiful and you're married, then it's a cardinal sin. You can't drink any alcohol. Uh, and, and, and here's the idea behind prohibition or censorship of these things. The idea seems logical, doesn't it? We're gonna pro, it seems logical. We're gonna, we're gonna prohibit people, we're gonna, we're gonna help them not sin. We're gonna help them live a life righteous and pleasing to God by just removing all of these external influences that are going to negatively affect them. If they don't ever have a beautiful woman to look at, they're never going to lust after her, and they're, they're, never, they're never going to commit any sin. They're never going to commit the sin of adultery. If we never allow them to, to listen to movies that have swear words with a rating higher than G, they're not going to have a potty mouth when they grow up. And they're not going to be as likely to lose a job or to offend another person. If we prohibit them from dancing, because it may lead to sex, then we're going to prevent them from getting pregnant and from contracting sexual diseases and ruining their life. So logically, censorship seems to make perfect sense. We're going to prevent people from having these, in, these influences on their life so that they won't sin as a result of it. But what's the outcome then? In the Christian world, the censorship, in a, in a word, it's failure. It's dismal failure. Uh, has anyone heard the term PK? 
Pastors' kids. <laughs> they're jokingly referred to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys, you to me. Yeah, they're they're jokingly referred to as as PKs. Yeah. Um, and of course, it's not a flattering term. But it's because pastors' kids are so widely known to be rebellious and get in all kinds of trouble when they grow up. And it's because of the sheltering that they have. And again. The motives of the parents seem good, but it's devastating. It's devastating on their lives. Because when we shelter, we prohibit our children or our, our family members, friends from knowing what Clyde was talking about, what's allowed versus what's expedient. Knowledge is necessary for righteous living. If we're going to live our lives in faith, we have to know what to do and what not to do. And in order to know, we have to experience those things. We have to know how far we can go and still honor God. Let's go to Galatians 5.1. I think, when isn't this your favorite verse? Absolutely. Yeah, it's one point two. Galatians 5.1, Paul says, For freedom, Christ frees us. Stand firm then, and be not again enthralled with the yoke of slavery. Now what are we freed from? What's the slavery that he's referring to here? We find out elsewhere that it's freedom from sin and death. Freedom from sin. That's why Paul says, All is allowed me, but not all is expedient. Again, we have to clarify, we have to learn what is expedient and not just allowed. But the point Paul's making here is that Christ has freed us. We can't out sin grace. In fact, the more sin increases, the more grace abounds. So we start there. That's our premise. And this is the key with, with censorship. It is impossible to be free when you're putting yourself in self-made bondage. And I'll repeat that. It's impossible to be free when you put yourself in self-made bondage. And that's exactly what censorship does. Here's why censorship doesn't work. You've all heard the term curiosity killed the cat. And it doesn't apply to kitties alone. Forbiddance of something leads to obsession with it. Right. And Martin touched on this earlier. We're going to look at a few examples here from Scripture. Let's start in the beginning with Adam and Eve. What do we have? Adam and Eve are given an entire garden, an, array, an endless array of choices that should be more than enough to satisfy their needs. But God tells them one tree is off limits. The fruit of this one tree you can't have. Now you would think logically that wouldn't be a big deal. Oh, okay, you've got all this around here. It's like we're, we're standing here looking out at these trees. Every one of them is at our disposal. We're free to go to it, to eat from it. But that one little one over there, we're, it, it's off limits. Stay away from it. And you know what Adam and Eve had to be doing in the garden prior to the, prior to the adversary? It had to be it's stewing all day, every day. Over, of course, they were living. But I can picture them in the garden just obsessing over this one tree. I, I have to know what's special about that tree. Now, now that I'm told I can't have it, I've got to have it. If you ever want someone to do something, demand that they don't do it. It's the surest way to get them to do it because forbiddance leads to obsession. Now, another example is... Moses and Pharaoh's daughter. And this one isn't as obvious, really, but I really doubt that his daughter would have been as apt to take in Moses as a baby if it wouldn't have been a Hebrew child that she knew was off limits. It was exciting. It was thrilling. You know, I'm not supposed to do this. And I'm the Pharaoh's daughter. So I've got to. Uh, David and Bathsheba is a great example. David had 500, I think, plus wives and concubines. And by the way, God told him he would have gladly given him more on a different note. 
But David had his pick of the litter. He was the king. He could have had any woman. And he sees Bathsheba, finds out that she's married to Uriah, and obsesses over her. She's off limits. Now, this is really interesting. There was a study conducted a while back, and I don't have the, the source information on this, but take my word for it. <laughs> the study that was conducted, there were several pictures of men in just you know various looks and things, but they took these pictures up to women, who were up to single women, and they said, rate this man just based on appearances on a scale of one to 10. And then they would take the same exact photos to other women, and they'd say, rate this married man on a scale of one to 10. They'd throw in one word, married. And in every single case, the married man was give, given two more points by the women who were judging these pictures. Now, part of that, of course, is, is likely because the woman knows that if the man's married, there's something worthwhile about him. But I think there's a good chance that it's also because it's thrilling that the man is off limits in a sense, just, or in their mind it is, because they don't understand Blitty. So, so the man seems off limits, and now I want him two points more than I did before. That's exactly what happened in the case of David and Bessie. But David had, he had hundreds of wives and concubines. Anyone will look at that and say, you know, you should be a pretty happy guy. You have nothing to complain about. But the one woman who was married, he obsessed over, and that obsession led to some sin. It, it led to adultery and to murder. We're not talking some minor sins here. David committed some pretty terrible sins because of his obsession. Adam and Eve brought sin into the world. Their sin, their obsession led to devastating consequences. And of course, thank God it did. It's all part of the plan. But in a relative sense, that's what it led to. Lot's wife is another example. God says, don't look back. As they're leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, and she's going, I've got to see, I've got to look. Is, is, is God really going to do anything to hurt me? So in that case, curiosity really did kill. Right? That's what happens. Samson's another example. In fact, twice, and the circumstances were a little different each time with both women, but his first wife, a Philistine, he gets into this battle, well, a, a, a riddle battle at his wedding with the Philistine men, and they can't figure out the riddle, and they're dying to know the answer because they don't want to lose the bet. So they go to her and say, you have to find out for us. And then she keeps crying and crying until finally Samson gives her the answer. Why was Samson yoked with a Philistine woman to begin with? Because he'd been told his whole life and was given by God a rebellious nature to begin with that he couldn't have anyone but an Israelite, but a Hebrew woman. So he obsesses over her when he meets her. And just as quickly as he meets her, he marries her. And it ends in devastating consequences. Further down the line, the same thing happens with Delilah. The Philistines use her to their advantage against him. And boy, it also speaks here to the power of women, doesn't it? And their influence over men. But that obsession ultimately led to Samson's capture his eyes being gouged out, and suicide. Again, all according to the purpose of God and for good, but that's what the obsession led to. Now, had censorship... Now, these guys didn't... They weren't prohibited from knowing the truth. David was without excuse when he committed his sins. He was well acquainted with the law. Samson had been raised as an Israelite, and he knew what was allowed versus what was expedient. But it serves to prove the point that any time we're told we can't do something, that something is off limits, we're going to obsess over it and be more likely to do it. It's like Gollum and Lord of the Rings. You know, my precious, I'm not even going to attempt to do the voice, but, but that's the way we, we feel about things that are forbidden to us. We see it in our daily lives, too, don't we? 
Every the beginning of every year is marked with commitments, New Year's resolutions to diet, to live healthier lives. If you're not Martin and can do it with all this willpower every day, then you know <laughs> you obsess over it. And just thinking of the word diet induces panic. We shouldn't call it that. We call it a lifestyle change or something because as soon as we start to think I'm going on a diet, we panic, don't we? It's scary because all of a sudden we start obsessing over the things that we're no longer allowed to have. And a good example of this is two women, friends, St. Marion and Pam. And Pam, maybe, maybe you both like chocolate. You love it. Most women do. Yeah. Now, now maybe, maybe you have decided that you're not going to allow yourself to eat any chocolate over the course of your diet because you're going to be you're going to be strict and you're going to do this right. Now, Marion says, you know what? I'd like to be able to do that, but I think I'm going to last a lot longer if I allow myself to have one or two small pieces every evening before bed just to satiate my, you know, that's her plan. Which one of you thinks is going to last longer? You're going to give up after a day or two obsessing over it and you're going to eat an entire bag. And not only was your diet not successful, but you added more weight on <laughs> because of it. In the meantime, Marion is content with her decreased limited portion and she's okay. And she's starting, the weight starts falling, you know, and and you're jealous. <laughs> you go, man, I, I should have rethought how I handled that. So the key is moderation. It's not strict prohibition of everything. And the reason for this is because prohibition, as, as Clyde was discussing yesterday, it shuts off everything natural about us. And when we do that, when we destroy and, 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 and shut down everything that makes up who we are, that God's created us to be, we have a big problem. We're not going to last very long doing that. That's why sex problems are so common in marriage, especially among wives, because they're taught their whole lives growing up that it's dirty, it's wicked, it's filthy, and it's not something to be enjoyed. It's a necessary evil that you have to get a license to do. So, so marriages often, one of the leading causes of divorce in the first few years of marriages is sexual frustration. In fact, oftentimes in, in fundamentalist religious couples, sex doesn't even happen. Their marriage is never even consummated. Think about that. That's the danger of censorship. That still goes on now. Hmm? That goes on now? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, I would bet that anyone in here who's done any counseling of, of Christian couples would say that they've met some who either never consummated their marriage, haven't had sex in a long time. I don't know. Have you went and glided? I actually know a couple that she hid in the bathroom on her wedding night and they got yeah. just scared. And because this had been so censored throughout her life that it was impossible for her to view it as anything other than dirty and sinful. You know, even when a Christian person is, is taught their whole life that sex is a beautiful thing within the context of marriage, sex is beautiful thing within context of sex, <laughs> even then, they still cannot get that out of their mind. It's, it's a near impossibility aside from God revealing this to them. Catholic priests, is it any surprise that so many of them have molested boys? Now, is it just a coincidence that Catholic priests are just this, this sect of people who by their nature are pedophiles no. with little boys? No. no, of course it isn't. They're prohibited. They're celibate. The church says in order to be holy, in order to be a priest, you have to refrain from all sexual activity. They obviously can't have sex and risk their, their glorious career with someone in their church or with another adult. It's too risky. So they have to turn to a kid. That, and that probably better than about any other example, proves the dangers of religious censorship. Let's turn now to Mark 7.
You're all probably familiar with this passage, but it ties in well with what we're talking about here. Starting first verse, And gathering to him are the Pharisees and some of the scribes coming from Jerusalem, and perceiving some of his disciples that with contaminated, that is unwashed hands, they eat bread. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, if ever they should not be washing the hands with the fists, are not eating, holding the tradition of the elders, and from the market, except they should be sprinkled, they are not eating. And many other things are there which they accepted to hold, the baptizing of cups and ewers and copper vessels and of couches. The Pharisees also and the scribes are inquiring of him, Wherefore are not your disciples walking according to the tradition of the elders, but with unwashed hands are eating bread? Yet he answering said to them, Ideally prophesies Isaiah concerning you hypocrites, as it is written, that this people with their lips is honoring me, yet their heart is away at a distance from me. Yet in vain are they reviving me, or revering me, teaching for teachings the directions of men. For leaving the precept of God, you are holding the tradition of men of the baptism of ewers and cups, and many such things you are doing. Down to verse 14. And calling the throng to him again, he said to them, Hear me all and understand, nothing is there outside of a man going into him which can contaminate him, but those things going out of a man are what is contaminating the man. Okay. So we find out here, the issue was the Pharisees are challenging Jesus because his disciples weren't holding the tradition of the elders of Israel to wash their hands before eating. And they, were, they had practiced this for so long that the lines were blurred between God's law and man's law. Mm -hmm. They couldn't make the distinction. To them, this tradition of washing hands prior to eating was every bit as much of God's law as anything else was. They had lost sight of this because tradition held this power over them. And traditions are one of the big culprits responsible for this censorship problem. Because when we don't recognize the distinction between what God tells us and what men do, mm -hmm. we're going to censor ourselves a lot more. We're going to make ourselves more moral than what God himself says he is in the law. That's exactly what Christianity does, and it needs to stop. So, you know, we talk about this stuff a lot, those of us who, who meet often. Um, I think, Clyde, didn't you, when, when, uh, when your kids were growing up, how'd you handle it if you saw a beautiful woman? <laughs> <laughs> we still do that. <laughs> what, 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 if, what if a naked woman came on the TV screen? <laughs> yeah. 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 The thought is, well, my son sees a naked woman, and he's gonna he's gonna obsess over that for sure. He's he's gonna grow up being this porn addict and going out and having sex with everybody that he can. You know, the opposite's true. Yeah, you want to create that, if you, then then switch the channel real quick. Yeah, that creates that. Exactly. Oh, yep. no, who wrote it? Yep, yep. Should we swear in front of our children? Yeah. You know what I I say. Don't worry so much about it. Now, don't go around, you know, F this, F that. But if your kids never hear a swear word growing up, they're going to be awfully shocked when they go out into the real world and they hear it everywhere, aren't they? Knowledge of this stuff is what prepares them, and, it, and it's what helps them to deal with what they experience. Otherwise, it's so shocking that they just overindulge in it to the point where it's very detrimental. That's where the problem comes into play. And is it any wonder that a lot of the people who end up really bad off with ruined lives are from the religious system? Mm -hmm. In fact, I would, I would argue that if we were to go out today and line up five religious people who grew up in a very fundamentalist, censorship-oriented home versus five people who grew up in a very worldly home the chances are very high that the worldly five would be much better adjusted people. Because they've had that experience. They've been given knowledge and they know from that experience what's allowed versus 
what's expedient, what's going to be for their good, and what's going to be to their detriment. That's the key. So, if you want to lose weight, don't completely limit every food that you love. Eat it, but in moderation. Allow yourself to have it. If you don't want to become an alcoholic, an obsessive over alcohol at point where it ruins your life, have a beer or two every now and then. Have a glass of wine. Don't completely prohibit it. Because guess what's going to happen the first time that you have a glass? Oh, I really like this. And then it's just non-stop from there. If you don't want your husband obsessing over other women, let him enjoy the beauty of other women as God's crowning creative achievement. Those are the answers. The answer is not overindulgence, and it's not complete forbiddance. The answer is moderation. And it's based in knowledge of all things so that we know what's allowed versus what's expedient. That's all I got. And Steve, how can you avoid temptation if there is no temptation? <laughs> yeah, you know, good we, point. We, we, we overcome things by being in the midst of those things. You right. can't overcome it if, if it's in the other room. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have some good friends. You know, I, I've, I've seen some shocking things that have happened to people who have grown up in the religious system in this bondage. And, you know, the, the second they see a topless woman on TV, it's like this carnal animal reaction to it. You know. And it's just to fulfill the lust of the flesh. It doesn't mean it won't be there. The lust also just don't fulfill it. If David fulfilled it, he went to yeah. the next level. Yeah, and it keeps you in such bondage because no, no man is capable of not noticing a beautiful woman and admiring that. No one's capable when they're maybe angry or excited of, of never saying hell or damn or another cuss word. I suppose, you know, if they train themselves over time. They'll just switch it out for another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. They'll make up for another one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it'll be darn instead of damn or crap instead of shit or whatever. It'll, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't say hell anymore, I say cold cell. What's that? I say cold cellar instead of hell. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's just funny. It's an old English word, right? Putting my vegetables in hell for the winter? Yeah. That's what I read that word. Hell came from. That's good.